Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. Thank you for joining us today from around the world for this online book launch and panel discussion on integrity and international justice, which is also being recorded. A warm welcome from Nuremberg on behalf of the International Nuremberg Principles Academy. My name is Vivian Dietrich, and it is my distinct pleasure to be moderating the event today. My virtual background, as you can see, is courtroom 600, the very courtroom where the trials took place some 75 years ago in the Nuremberg Palace of Justice. Integrity is increasingly in the news. The resonance to the topic demonstrates its contemporary relevance. The topical salience and urgency of recognizing and revisiting integrity in international justice has come into sharper relief through countless conversations, contributions and contexts. Cultivating integrity and bolstering a culture of accountability appears critical to enhance the confidence of the public in justice institutions and to enhance the upholding of the rule of law. And here the interplay of formal prescription and rule compliance on the one hand and norm setting and cultural approaches on the other hand seems paramount. We will be getting into these issues in the course of the discussion. Now, today I am joined by five distinguished practitioners and experts who have different backgrounds, different perspectives, as we have wished to have an array and diverse set of views represented on this panel today. And they all have in common that they contributed to the book that we're launching today. So I would like to warmly welcome all speakers here today. And Judge Richard Goldstone, who's most recently the chair of the Independent Expert Review, but also, of course, former chief prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and for Rwanda. Judge Ivana Irlichkova, president of the Special Tribunal for Lebanon. Judge Adel Maget, vice president of the Court of Cassation of Egypt. Bridget Indar, co-founder and former executive director of the Women's Initiative for Gender Justice. And Gunnar Ekelif Slidal, director of policies the Norwegian Helsinki Committee. Thank you very much for joining us today. In the next 90 minutes, we will first present the new book and then engage in a panel discussion on the high moral character requirement and the notion of integrity, on the independent expert review and the report issued, the relationship between independence and integrity and how to cultivate integrity and nurture a culture of integrity in international justice institutions today. The panelists look forward to answering some of your questions and we invite you to use the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Please keep in mind, of course, due to the large number of participants and limited time, not all questions may be answered today. A special thank you, I would like to say at this point, to the Nuremberg Academy team for supporting the event today and making it all possible. And behind the scenes, I'd like to especially thank Maria Alejandra, Evelyn and Frauke. If you are tweeting today, you may wish to use the hashtag integrity in justice. The anthology Integrity and in International Justice was published recently and today we are officially launching the book. As series editor, I am particularly pleased that the book was published as the fourth volume in the Nuremberg Academy series. The third volume in the series was published just three months ago the Tokyo Tribunal Perspectives on Law, History and Memory, which presented a contemporary rereading of the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, combining perspectives from law, history and social science. At the outset of this book launch, I would like to acknowledge the contributions and support of many experts and colleagues, without which the anthology would not have been possible. We are very grateful to the publisher and the excellent TOAP team, and also the Nuremberg Academy team. A special thank you, I would like to say, to co-editor Morten Bergsmoor for his untiring dedication and commitment to this topic. As we all know, it was a mighty effort to pull this book together. Last but not least, I would like to again say a big thank you to all contributors, among them leading practitioners and scholars. And I know many of the authors are with us here today for the book launch. For those of us who are joining us now from near and far, I warmly welcome you all. I know we have national and international experts with us, judges, prosecutors, lawyers, representatives from civil society and international organizations, as well as scholars and students. 
Thank you for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to now briefly present the book. The anthology Integrity and International Justice is the most tangible result to date of the integrity project undertaken by the International Nuremberg Principles Academy and the Center for International Law, Research and Policy. It draws on papers invited for an international conference held in the Peace Palace in The Hague on 1 and 2 December 2018 and some additional chapters. The conference brought together more than 40 leading scholars and practitioners from Africa, America, Asia and Europe. During the opening session of the conference, Deputy Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court, James Stewart, emphasized the legal requirement of individual integrity and its relevance in the prosecution of international crimes. The importance of integrity in international justice was also highlighted by Judge Marc Perrin de Brichambault and Judge Eric Mose in their opening remarks. The new book, which draws on the international conference, is now available as an open access publication. It is a weighty tome for those of you who have held it in their hands as it is also available as a hardcover. While this is the first book on integrity and international justice, there has been a growing corpus of writing on integrity more broadly. The concept of integrity is used in multifarious ways in the literature. And in an attempt to move beyond snapshot descriptions or anecdotalism, this book advances new understandings of integrity and includes important policy relevant insights. The anthology features perceptive and incisive readings, including at times conceptually astute, but always practice oriented reflections on integrity and international justice in a forward looking manner. The book will provide a source of inspiration for further conceptual work and theoretically driven yet empirically grounded research, I'm sure. With more than 30 chapters organized into six parts, this anthology brings together sophisticated yet accessible contributions. The book addresses various topics, including first, the meaning and integrity and the historical, religious and philosophical origins of the term itself. Second, how the awareness of and culture of integrity can be strengthened. Third, the role of states and international organizations in enhancing the integrity standard in international justice. Fourth, the role of international courts and tribunals themselves. Fifth, particular integrity standards in the context of cases. And sixth, the relationship between the independence and the integrity standards. Et voilà, those are the six parts in a nutshell. And of course, we invite you to discover and delve into these topics in much more depth in the book itself. The anthology does not shy away from some of the inevitably thorny issues and vigorous debates in the field, but without tabloidizing serious concerns. With contributions from both practitioners and scholars, the six part anthology showcases wide ranging issues often discussed from various perspectives with contributors sometimes drawing markedly different conclusions and providing insightful accounts. Given the comprehensive and wide scope, as well as the prolific interplay of theory and practice, this book published in the Nuremberg Academy series promises to become a standard reference book on the topic of integrity in the years to come. Of course, I would have liked to invite co-editor Morten Bergsmore to join me in presenting this book. However, he was unfortunately not able to join us today. But I am glad that Gunnar Ekolov Slidal, who is joining us from Norway, was able to step in and I now invite him to say a few words about the book and the contribution it makes to the field in his view, and also explain the choice of cover image of Sir Thomas More. Over to you, Gunnar. Thank you uh, for inviting me to present the book and congratulations to the editors, um, Vivian Dietrich and Morten Bergsmo. I think they have done a great job. The anthology in my mind is a gold mine of reflections and advices on how to tackle in integrity issues in international justice. I also want to pay tribute to the two institutions that stand behind the book. The International Nuremberg Principles Academy, headed by Director Klaus Rakwitz, and the Center for International Law Research and Policy, headed by Director Bergsmo. And as Viviana said, the book is written by a large group of lawyers, academics and NGO experts. 
this cooperative scholarship has resulted in a big, very big, but also quite readable book. It's clear conceptual structure contributes to this. What to expect from the anthology? Well, it gives insights on the meaning and importance of integrity and on how to build a culture of integrity. It provides discussions on integrity as a precondition for institutional independence. And it also describes how international justice institutions differ from national institutions by standing more alone and their dealings being less scrutinized by external oversight, media and civil society. This result in a risk that integrity deficiencies are not addressed properly. There may simply not be enough external pressure on the institutions. This is why it is pertinent that the book focus on individual integrity as a legally binding standard. It follows that integrity of an international institution largely depends on the integrity standards of its leaders and staff. It also follows that it is paramount to foster strong cultures of integrity within such institutions. They can be decisive in helping staff to uphold integrity in difficult situations. And to build such cultures, the leadership must create forums for learning and training, as well as exemplify integrity themselves. The book also invites learning from religious and philosophical traditions, as well as from heroes such as Sir Thomas More and Dag Hammarskjöld. The timing of the book could not have been better. There is now a marked focus on integrity as a precondition for institutional success. The introductory chapter by the editors provides some reasons for this. Multilateralism is under pressure. And some of the biggest world powers are all standing outside the International Criminal Court. Quote, watching attentively its every move, noting any weakness that could serve their perceived future interests. End of quote. So by insisting on individual integrity, the anthology complements the report of the independent expert review of the ICC and the Rome Statute. Uh, system, which amounts to a systemic review. According to its editors, it adds, quote, an additional paradigm to the IER report by exploring in detail the origins and meanings of the integrity standards, how awareness of integrity can be raised and what contributes to reinforcing an integrity mindset of staff. During years of engagement with international institutions representing the Norwegian Helsinki Committee, I have observed, observed many times the detrimental effects of integrity failures and the need both, both for systemic and individual remedies. My most important contribution to the anthology though is to explore what Sir Thomas More, a Renaissance reformist and official at the highest levels of the English state, may offer in terms of principles and strategies on how to strengthen integrity in justice. He introduced and framed the word integrity in the English language. He considered conscience as the bedrock of moral and professional integrity. A conscience borne by Christian principles and by law. He referred to an informed conscience shaped by years of study and reflection. His life and career consistently exemplified integrity as self-integration. He stood for something, not giving in to pressure. And at the same time, he was always willing to reason and provide arguments. I think that the fact that his thoughts are still relevant today should teach us that integrity must remain a vital concern for the long term. Integrity is not a fashion. It is a fundamental precondition of justice. Finally, who should read the book? I suggest, firstly, leaders and staff of international courts and organizations. Secondly, 
academics, students, and civil society representatives involved in international justice. Thirdly, diplomats and consultants of state parties. And fourthly, the wider public interested in debates on how international justice can contribute to a better world. In this category, I also include states that consider becoming members of the International Criminal Court. They will all find something to learn from the book. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gunnar. Thank you. That's greatly appreciated. And also your incisive reading of Sir Thomas More and his relation to integrity. Very, very important point made. Thank you. There are so many facets and perspectives relevant to integrity in international justice, and inevitably we have to make choices in an event like this one. In the upcoming panel discussion, we will focus on four key topics, the high moral character requirement and the notion of integrity, the independent expert review, the relationship between independence and integrity, and last but certainly not least, how to cultivate integrity and nurture a culture of integrity and accountability in international justice institutions. For legal practice, integrity is fundamental. Corruption or lack of integrity of any kind, whether real or perceived, is detrimental in any justice system. Bolstering the rule of law and the culture of integrity seems essential thus to prevent integrity violations from happening, and when they do occur, to address them effectively. Indeed, Integrity, impartiality, and independence are core requirements for a functioning, effective, and meaningful judiciary and justice system. In an era in which the rule of law is under increased threat and under pressure and fundamental norms are being contested, it is all the more important to focus our attention on fundamental norms and on integrity. Now, it is my pleasure to invite our panelists to join me for a panel discussion all of whom contributed to the anthology with excellent chapters and have extensive experience in various roles. Judge Richard Goldstone, Judge Ivana Irlichkova, Judge Adel Maget and Bridget Inda. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Let's turn first to a topic that has received wide attention recently, the meaning and understanding of high moral character and the notion of integrity. The theme of integrity even became a watchword during this past year, um, leading up to the election of the third ICC prosecutor and new ICC judges. This surge in interest should be welcomed wholeheartedly, although one should of course be wary of any attempt to instrumentalize what is fundamentally an important subject for the future of international criminal justice. It has been reiterated that it is essential that the next prosecutor is a person of the highest moral integrity and professionalism. And anecdotes can obviously be valuable if they translate into proper evidence, whereas deliberate rumor mongering and prejudice must be handled with care when basic interests of international courts and as well as individuals are at stake. In international justice, the term integrity is often used in connection with the expression high moral character. And in the ICC statute, for example, Article 36.3a mentions both these standards whereas Article 42.3 only mentions high moral character. So allow me to start with you, Richard, um, who's joining us from South Africa today. How is this notion of integrity linked to the concept of high moral character? And how is this really relevant in the election process of high level officials, judges and prosecutors, and even beyond for international courts? Vivian, thank you very much for inviting me to join, to, to join this panel. But before I come to your question, may, may I be presumptuous and congratulate you and Morton Bergsberg, I'm sorry he's not with us today, but to congratulate the two of you on producing this, this outstanding publication. Uh, you refer to it correctly as an anthology, uh, but, but, but I, would, I, I would hasten to add that it's really much more than that. It's, it's a wonderful resource for all of the people that, that Gunnar referred to, in particular practitioners, students, and even members of the general public. It's really an encyclopedia on, on integrity in, in international justice, and also a lot of it applies to domestic justice, because as, as, as integrity is, is crucial and lies at the heart of international justice, 
it is also at, lies at the heart of, of the rule of law uh, in, uh, and, and also applies to, to domestic courts. So, 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 so warm congratulations on, uh, on this publication. The, the requirement of high moral character uh, in, in, the, in the Rome Statute and in the appointment of, of, of judges and prosecutors uh, domestically and internationally uh, lies at the core of the, of, the, of the work and the reputation of, of, of judicial organizations. Uh, high moral character really is, is a requirement to ensure that the organization, that the institution has, has integrity. Um, the integrity is important uh, in, in, international, in, in international courts, uh, not only, but in particular because of the, 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 the political background and context in which they operate. Uh, we, when I teach courses on international criminal justice, I emphasize all the time that you have to understand the politics of international justice to understand international justice itself. And, and because of the, the, the winds that are blowing in, 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 in opposite directions, the political wind, uh, winds, it's crucially important for the victims, for the general public, uh, and I would emphasize for governments to have absolute confidence in the integrity of these institutions, the integrity of the judges, the integrity of the, of the, of, of the office of the prosecutor, and the integrity of all the staff who, 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 who are employed in, uh, in these organizations. Um, as, as you state, Vivian, uh, in, in the preface together with, with, with Merton, uh, the, the, the very success of, of international justice uh, uh, is jeopardized if there isn't full, full, full integrity, uh, uh, both, both actual uh, and perceived. And that is why so much depends on the electoral pro process uh, that's, uh, that, that, that went on in the election by the Assembly of States parties uh, very recently and the six new judges uh, who, who, who have been appointed uh, to, to, to the bench of the International Criminal Court and, and the process that's still uh, in operation in, in selecting a, a, a new prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. The topic was regarded by the independent expert review members as so important that, that we added uh, to, 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 our, to our agenda. It wasn't there. The ISP didn't, didn't appoint us uh, to, to have a look at the election process of judges. But we regarded this as so important that, that we took it upon ourselves to add that to, to our agenda. So, it, and, and it, it, it shouldn't be a difficult matter uh, for the ASP to access information regarding the high moral character of candidates for judicial appointments or appointments as, as prosecutor and deputy prosecutor. The, the people who are being looked at have had careers uh, in the public, public careers. And, and, and if the proper process is applied, particularly domestically, in, in selecting and putting forward nominees, it shouldn't, be, it shouldn't really be difficult for the Assembly of States parties to, to, to garner at, and, and achieve and receive the, the fullest information regarding the, the, the reputations and integrity of, of the candidates. I, I will leave it at that. Thanks very much, Richard, and I'm sure we'll get Thanks very much, Richard, and I'm sure we'll get into the, the details of the independent expert review in, in just a moment, but um, you're absolutely right in highlighting that that point was taken up, um, and of course it's a very important one, the election process and nomination process. Ivana, let me ask you to, to join us here. Um, you've obviously got extensive experience. What's your perspective on this interlinkage of the requirement of high moral character and the notion of integrity and the election process? Thank, thank you very much, Vivian. And I just would like very briefly also congratulate you and Morton for absolutely amazing work uh, to collect this outstanding book, organizing uh, the conference uh, more than two years ago in the Peace Palace. 
and uh, setting up this, this panel. I think this topic is really highly important and we can see that it's more and more important. And I think uh, public discussion and reading book uh, such uh, such this is the first step to, to making progress. I think the topic is highly relevant and integrity of international justice invokes both institutional and individual integrity. And the high moral character relates to individual integrity, personality, and behavior traits. But the high moral character is a clause as requirement for appointment or election judges used and found in statutes or equivalent text in the ICC ad hoc tribunals and uh, such as STL. The requirement is that uh, the judges shall be persons of high moral characters, impartiality, integrity, with extensive judicial experience. But uh, high moral character is uh, not the only necessary quality relevant to integrity of institutions. Institutional legitimacy also requires appointment of persons with relevant professional experience and demonstrable skills, professionalism, leadership, managerial administrative skills that also required for judges and prosecutors, and also ability to work with diverse teams at workplaces. And the integrity of institutions also means keeping in mind diversity, gender, geographical diversity, legal culture, traditions. And it is particularly important in international context. And I think selection of judges, either election or appointment is it is the key to preserve integrity of the whole of institution. And uh, there are some specific of international environment, especially for judges, because, and it's maybe some differences from national judiciaries, because judges appointed or elected to international criminal tribunals are most or less judges with, uh, with uh, high level professional experiences, but they are coming from different cultures, different backgrounds, different legal systems. And usually there are strong personalities who reached quite exceptional achievement in their national judiciary. And then, and that's why usually judges were appointed um, to, the, to the international tribunals. But, um, but from such an individualized position, they are coming to the institution and sometimes become junior colleagues to, to the others. So I think also to manage expectations from both sides, the judges who are joining the institution, from the institution and, and public, I think it's I think it's really highly, highly important. That's why I think and we will discuss later. Um, I, I am really supportive of to have code of ethics, code of conduct uh, for judges of international tribunals uh, for many reasons. And one of the reasons is to know the expectations because uh, because judges, as, as Richard said, it should not be too difficult to, to assess integrity and high moral character. But sometimes the expectations, different expectations may lead to some different views. So I think this is really extremely important. And uh, one important uh, thing I wanted to mention is that also the interest of the institution must go first before individual interest of, of judges. And also it must be, must be set, up, uh, set up clear in the beginning. So that's why selection of the judges is, um, is uh, uh, greatly important and probably the most important is in the whole process. Thanks. Thanks, Ivana. I think you mentioned the legal and political dynamics, but also really highlight the importance of social dynamics um, that then go on in the courts. And, and I'm sure we'll, we'll come back to that when we speak about this idea of culture of integrity. Ultimately, states parties are responsible for the election of judges and prosecutors of international courts. And this is an important responsibility that requires vigilance. Um, Bridget, let me bring you in here. Um, I know you're joining us today all the way from New Zealand at an unreasonable hour. Um, so thanks very much for being with us today. Um, at the moment, you're senior consultant and mediator and have extensive experience, of course, in um, civil society matters. So what is your view on the role of states, civil society, and indeed also individuals in upholding integrity in the elections of ICC high officials, um, but also beyond elections, day in, day out? Mm. 
Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for uh, the invitation to participate in the panel. And um, I just want to add my voice to other panelists in congratulating you and Morton for this wonderful um, book, the book that is being launched today. Um, as, uh, as Richard has said, it really will be a wonderful resource. Uh, and we hope in time as the ethical and institutional integrity issues of the ICC further evolve and develop, that this will be a touchstone people may go back to, uh, to consider and reflect on how, how far the ICC has evolved and come. Um, the world in some respects is in a moment of transition and I believe that is also true for the ICC, um, more so because of the important re report and work and recommendations within the independent expert review, as well as the reflections in the book that we're launching today. These two documents um, provide a public articulation of, in my view, systemic and long-standing ethics and integrity challenges, breaches and violations at the court, which has, I think, exposed a culture of unaccountability and has culminated in something of a credibility crisis for the court. Um, in, in many respects, this crisis has been entirely foreseeable. Um, I was formerly the executive director of the Women's Initiatives for Gender Justice. And during that time, we established a monitoring program tracking and monitoring the institutional development of the ICC over, over a period of, of about 16 years. And so it is based on that, that we're able to look at that data and um, identify where the ICC, um, both court officials, staff and states parties veered off track with respect to supporting the development and establishment of an ethically oriented institution. And we see in that review, and it's summarized in my chapter in your wonderful book, um, that it veered off track almost immediately uh, with the decision not to include a code of conduct in the regulations of the OTP um, and deviations in the ICC staff rules compared to those of the UN. I'll go into some of those issues a little later, but I think what we're seeing now are the consequences of the lack of effective oversight and governance by states parties over the past 20 years as well as the implications of some of the day-to-day -day decisions by key court officials and others in leadership positions at critical moments over the past two decades. In some respects, elections themselves are examples of integrity related issues, um, both in the manner and ways in which they are conducted, uh, as well as the results of the elections and the officials who are then bestowed with the responsibility to lead the court. It has always been true for the ICC election, not just uh, in the current election, but it has always been important for the ICC to elect integrity conscious leaders. And yet um, it has almost never received the attention, the serious attention, that consideration of character issues or personal integrity and individual fortitude deserve. It seems to me that historically um, personal integrity and character issues um, have been assumed and bestowed upon nominees simply by virtue of being nominated by the state's party. In reality, often little effort has been made by either the nominating state or by state's parties as a whole to ass assess and tease out the fitness for office of individual nominees and those ultimately elected to, the, um, to official positions within the, within the International Criminal Court. In this election cycle, and in particular in relation to the forthcoming election of the next prosecutor, issues of character and personal integrity have received more attention than in the past. Um, important questions have been raised. Um, and I think amongst other things, this has exposed the deficiencies in the assessment process of states parties. In other words, the committee on, uh, on the election of the prosecutor which claimed it was unable to properly assess uh, and deal with any issues that had been raised. To me, this suggests a perhaps systemic indifference on the part of states parties to want to receive, consider uh, and address character issues. The, IC, the states parties have hosted numerous elections, numerous judicial elections. Um, and this is the third election cycle for the prosecutor position if they were sincerely interested in character and personal integrity issues, it seems to me that they would have established the ability to deal with 
integrity issues should they arise in the process of the nomination and election um, procedures. I think given the important advocacy on these issues um, led by civil society that it, I hope in the future that the election committees will be better equipped to consider any and all substantive issues that may arise. And that's important for the integrity of the process. It's also important for the fairness and proper and due process for those, uh, for those involved. But issues of integrity and character, uh, we, we readily understand and accept that these apply to elections involving those hoping to hold uh, high official positions within the ICC. But character and integrity also applies to the, to the election of states parties representatives uh, and importantly, to the politically powerful positions of those elected to the ASP president and vice presidency roles, the election of the audit committee, the election of members to the bureau, and the election of individuals to the committee on budget and finance. These office holders possess significant decision making and norm setting powers with respect to the institutional development of the ICC because they provide oversight of the court's compliance with its regulatory framework, they monitor and ensure its institutional integrity, and they are required themselves to provide um, uh, exemplary conduct as, as officials, uh, states parties officials with leadership responsibilities for the International Criminal Court. And yet these powers are invested in the hands of officials in a process which does not require an assessment of character or integrity. Unlike at least on paper, the requirement to assess character and integrity with respect to those being considered and elected into positions within the International Criminal Court. I was struck by um, one of the many comments I was struck by in the IAR uh, found that there was widespread distrust of the ASP within all organs of the court. The report doesn't reflect on whether there was widespread mistrust of the um, subsidiary bodies of the ASP, such as the Audit Committee, the CBF, the Bureau, et cetera. But I think it's striking that all organs of the court express some level of distrust of the ASP. And I, to me, that says that a trusted pair of hands from the perspective of states' parties um, may not always be a trustworthy pair of hands from the perspective of court officials, ICC staff, and civil society stakeholders. But elections, as you've, as you've mentioned, are just one component of the development of an ethics-oriented court. Um, the internal work that needs to be done day by day, month by month, year by year, establishing a robust regulatory framework, um, supporting a culture that understands the framework, is committed to complying with it, um, is actively supporting staff to address and consider ethical issues as they arise in the course of their work, which demonstrates in its leadership, exemplary conduct, but also equally demonstrates um, the importance of respecting the boundaries and clarity provided by the regulator regulatory framework, including when those um, boundaries and rules regulations are breached, that there is a healthy accountability for the individuals involved and therefore for the institution. This helps preserve the integrity of the International Criminal Court as a public um, as a public institution for justice. Thanks very much, Bridget. I think we're going to come back to some of the topics you've canvassed abroad, Ari, and really highlighted the importance of the advocacy efforts. We'll come back to internet in the independent expert review in just a moment as well. But I'd like to, to give Adele a chance to, to chime in here. And he, of course, brings this invaluable perspective of a judge currently occupying judicial office in a national jurisdiction. Um, so before we turn again to the International Court, um, I'd like to invite Adel to join us here. I understand the publication and your chapter in particular on Sharia sources and the notion of integrity was received with great appreciation in Egypt. Um, and there was a considerable media echo in the country itself on this topic of integrity. Um, a formal statement even was issued by the Judges Club and an official letter has been sent to the Court of Cassation from the Egyptian parliament congratulating you on this first work to address the topic of judicial integrity in depth from an Islamic um, Sharia scholarly perspective. So there's been quite a bit of um, public attention to the topic. Um, so Adele, could you enlighten us? How can the notion of high moral character be interpreted in practice? And what can international judicial institutions maybe learn from national 
judicial practice um, and legal systems beyond the civil and common law systems. Thank you, Vivian. As a matter of fact, I'm going to thank you not only for selecting me to participate in this inter interesting anthology, uh, but for giving me the chance to go in a long journey in depth in Islamic Sharia resources. For me, as an Arab and, and, and a Muslim as well, I didn't expect that I will find such wealth in Islamic Sharia resources when it comes to norms like integrity and the judicial function and the administration of justice. I have written before on international criminal law from Islamic Sharia perspective, on international human law, Islamic international humanitarian law, but this is the first time I address such topics which is connected to the judiciary. So thank you and thank us to Martin as well, who is the director of the Central of International Law Research and Policy for giving me the chance to, to go in depth analysis and the study in Islamic Sharia sources in, on integrity and high moral character required to hold the judicial position. As a matter of fact, you know that beside my scholarly contribution, I'm working as a sitting judge. And the pa pandemic, during the first wave of the pandemic, it was a chance for me, as a matter of fact, in the first lockdown, just to sit for four months at home, concentrating on this ancient, we call it mothers of the books of Islamic Sharia, early classical Islamic Sharia books to investigate and explore what the notion itself means, integrity. Interestingly, um, it was supposed I, I was firstly invited to write around 25, 30 pages on, the, uh, on integrity, on the notion in Islamic Sharia. It ended with 58 pages on integrity in Islamic Sharia. I found, and I'm, 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 I, am, I am just saying this for my colleagues who are interested to, to work on, on issues of integrity and high moral character, uh, and, and, and would like to search on Islamic Sharia resources to tell them that there are a huge amount of resources early classical Sharia resources on integrity. And I will focus on three resources and I will advise everyone to have a look at the resources because some of them, some of them are translated into English. Firstly, the well-known judicial messages on integrity by Caliph Omar ibn Khattab and Khalifa, Khalifa Omar ibn Khattab and Khalifa Ali ibn Abi Talib. We call these messages as the charter of judicial conduct. Both of these messages provide not only the standards of the administration of justice, no, but also the qualifications and the qualities required to be appointed as a judge. It is amazing. And when you read some um, paragraphs of both messages, you would immediately think that where we can find such judges, for example, and I will read from Ali ibn Abi Talib message on how to select a judge. A ju a judge. For adjudicate, adjudicating on people's disputes, select one whom you trust. He's addressing one of his commissioner in Egypt at this time, which is 13 centuries ago. For adjudicating one people's disputes, select one whom you trust. 
one who is by far the best among your subjects, in your view, one who is patient, one who is not influenced by the importunity of the litigants, one who does not persist if he commits an error and hold back to the truth, one who does not have any tendency to covetousness, and one who does not vain to flattery and is not easily tempted. This is some of the qualification of judges required in Islamic Sharia uh, to be appointed to this um, virtuous position. In Islamic Sharia, adjudication is to be considered as a divine mission. Adjudication is to be seen as a religious duty as well. According to Khalifa Umar ibn Khattab, adjudication Islam is based on a precise obligation stipulated in the Quran. Stipulated in the Quran and is a followed prophetic tradition. When, when I'm, I'm, I'm saying followed prophetic tradition, I'm also uh, referring to Prophet Muhammad tradition, which is his hadith, his sayings, and the practices as well. Um, accordingly, Islamic fiqh jurisprudence views the act of judging between people as an esteemed religious duty that is to be considered as a supreme act of worship. As a result of their divine mission, judges should possess high moral character and should discharge their duties with the utmost form of integrity. If we look back at the uh, Article 36 of the ICC statute and other documents such as the Code of the Judicial Ethics of the ICC as well, we will not find a definition of what high moral character means. We will not find a definition of what dignity and integrity means. In this case, we have to resort to other sources. We can resort to, to national, national jurisprudence which illuminate on these notions and concepts. Interestingly, when Islamic Sharia address integrity, it addresses it in, from two aspects, from a personal aspect and a professional aspect as well. So when we talk about integrity in Islamic Sharia, we will talk it from, we will tackle personal integrity and professional integrity. And again, when you look at the two messages of the Khalifas, Ali ibn Abi Talib and Umar ibn Khattab, you will notice how the two messages award integrity a great importance, either in the selection of judges for this uh, judicial function, esteemed judicial function, or for the conduct, conduct of the judges themselves during trials and beyond. Islamic Sharia treatises on Adab al-Qadi. Adab al-Qadi is many treatises um, written by early classical uh, jurist, Islamic jurists, uh, deals with only the judicial function. In these treatises, they focus on which qualities you should choose for a judge uh, who is nominated for a judicial for a person who is nominated for judicial position? Adele, thank you for sharing this really illuminating um, introduction to Islamic Sharia 
perspective on why the notion of high moral character is so important and how actually it is interpreted in practice. Um, I hope we have time also to get back to that in more depth um, in just a moment. But let's turn for now to the international sphere once again. And the Independent Expert Review has been mentioned quite some time. So I'd like to briefly focus on this. As you all know, on the 30th of September, the report um, was published, which runs to 348 pages and includes 384 recommendations. And the notion of integrity seems visible throughout the report, particularly where ethical and appropriate behavior is discussed. The report states that, quote, ethics has been identified as an important topic for all stakeholders, highlighting, quote, allegations of conflicts of interest, potential ethics violations or inappropriate behavior. The independent expert review also highlights particular measures that the court can adopt internally to foster integrity, transparency and accountability. And, and Richard, let me start with you, given your leadership role in the process. How was your experience of chairing the independent expert review? And could you perhaps elaborate on the importance the experts placed on integrity? Well, really, and firstly, let me say that it was a great pleasure and a privilege to, to work with, with, the, with my eight colleagues uh, who were appointed by the ASP to, to the Independent Expert Review. We came literally from the four corners of the, uh, of the world. Uh, we, we, we had in common experience and, and some expertise in, in one or more of the three clusters in which we were divided on governance, on the, on, uh, on the judges and on investigations and the office of the prosecutor. We were also uh, very, very fortunate in having the assistance of three uh, outstanding research assistants. I know that two of them, Maria and Gabriella, are in the audience with us uh, as I speak. Um, the, the report, I think, indicates by its length and depth the 384, uh, the 348 recommendations, I think, indicate the 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 need for for reform uh, in the in the organs of the International Criminal Court. Um, as pointed out in the introductory chapter of of, of, of the book that that we are launching today, um, there are substantial findings and recommendations, as you've already suggested relating to issues of integrity and, uh, and ethics. Um, particular attention uh, is paid in the report to what we, we really found to be a shortfall in the attention that is devoted to, to particularly to gender discrimination and to harassment. Uh, there, there, there's an unevenness in the way these, the, these topics are dealt with in the, in the organs of the court. And that's not a good thing. Uh, there, there should obviously be a, 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 a w one playing field and one one standard, and importantly, what 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 we what we uh, f f found to be a, a shortfall was uh, in the question of accountability uh, and 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 the the assurance that particularly members of staff should have the absolute absolute assurance that there is zero tolerance for any form of, of, of inappropriate discrimination uh, or, or, or harassment, and particularly uh, on, 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 on the basis of, of gender. Um, I've already said something about accountability, uh, and that's important in any bureaucratic system. It was certainly in my experience in the ICTY and ICTR, and, 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 in, the, and in this investigation, that accountability and, and confidence in the accountability system is crucial to, to the health of, of, of any international organization, and perhaps particularly a, a, a judicial uh, institution. Um, we, we've, uh, we have also uh, uh, suggested, and I would add, it, it seems fairly obvious that, that at, at the heart of, of uh, ethics and, uh, and at the heart of integrity li lies leadership. There has to be from, from, from the top leaders, this has to be asserted every day in the life of an institution uh, that there will be no tolerance for, for bullying and harassment and other, inappropriate, uh, and other inappropriate conduct. So, so let me leave it at that, Vivian. Obviously we dealt with, 
with, with, with probably hundreds of topics. We, we, we had hundreds of interviews. We received thousands of pages of, of, of uh, reports and, 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 and suggestions uh, during the course of our investigation between uh, re effectively February uh, and September of, of 2020. Indeed. Thank you very much, Richard. And as you rightly point out, the, the report is, of course, so rich. Um, I think we need many, many more hours to dissect all the individual findings and recommendations in um, greater depth. Um, but thank you for pointing out some of the important um, aspects as they relate directly to integrity and immediately following up and cognizant of some of the findings and recommendations. Bridget, um, let me ask you, what stands out for you of this independent expert review report. Um, is institutional reform needed in your view at the ICC to ensure greater awareness and this culture of awareness that we've been speaking about? Well, yes, certainly. I mean, it, it's clear from, from the report, it's clear from advocacy over many years by civil society, it's clear from this publication today that institutional reform is needed. But in some ways beyond that, the court also needs not just reform, but a kind of renewal a renewal of a reorientation towards its mandate, a renewal and a revival of the aspiration and inspiration that gave rise to this incredible treaty, um, the Rome Statute, and the important work of uh, the ICC for humanity um, as a key component in the multilateral system around peace, security and justice. Um, so a renewal um, from within and a renewal of its pride in itself and its confidence in itself to be a trustworthy, rule-respecting, human rights-respecting, compliant, ethics-oriented uh, institution. Um, some of the, it, currently it's clear, at least it's clear to me, in, in my view, that the ICC is un, untethered from a clear, strong ethical framework and culture. And part of that uh, untethering um, in part is because of its own history as being an independent institution um, asserting its independence quite rightly from the U United Nations um, and asserting its statutory independence from the Security Council, but likewise that the UN does not have a governance role with respect to the ICC, unlike the other ad hoc tribunals. Um, the, the ICC, uh, the other ad hoc tribunals which reported to the Security Council, um, the ICC is unique in that it only supports to its states parties, except for referrals um, uh, for situations that have been referred by the Security Council, and it elects its own officials. And this independence is crucial uh, for the court to be able to be um, a nimble institution, to be able to develop its own systems and practices because of its unique statute and role within um, the international justice sector and uh, for humanity at large. Um, but the lack of being tethered to an ethical framework um, has meant that it has struggled to develop its own ethical framework in a way that is comprehensive and has been accepted across the board by all of the organs of the court and by states parties. So in addition to reform, yes, but it also needs a kind of renewal and it needs to be recommitted to the, establishing, the establishment of some critical pieces that were overlooked in the institution building phase of the court. Um, institution building is an ongoing process. Uh, the court gave itself a few years initially to do that, supported and enabled by states parties, in fact, not even a few years before they, before they announced the institution building phase was over and they were now about action. Um, I want to say a couple of things though about um, the importance again of the individual um, because the, one cannot overlook the role of the individual within the institution. And so reform and renewal is also at the personal and individual level as it is at the section and unit level, as it is division by division and organ by organ, and then uh, as the court as a whole. Um, and also to consider the impact of the individual and the that they have on each other, the individual and the institution uh, have on each other, and the conditions of, su of suggestion uh, by which individuals are constantly surrounded. Um, ultimately, uh, recognizing that the ethical culture of an institution affects the ability of good people to do the right thing. Um, I want to just quickly comment on two issues that um, Richard has mentioned, the gender discrimination and harassment. Um, in my view, um, organizations that are weak on sexual harassment, meaning uh, weak in their systems of identifying, addressing and preventing sexual harassment, 
um, are also likely to be weak in other areas of institutional integrity, in other areas of ethics, in other areas of internal compliance and in accountability. So as an issue, sexual harassment is never an outlier. It is always emblematic. It is always emblematic of a system and a culture that uh, enables and allows um, or fails to prevent, fails to provide accountability um, and has a number of ethics and integrity related issues out of which sexual harassment is one of those manifestations. Um, so it's sexual harassment as is an issue is never an outlier. It is always emblematic. So for example, you're not going to have an, an organization that has great, uh, a great ethics culture. It's great with compliance. It has a strong regulatory framework. Everyone understands it and is committed to it and is motivated by it. And yet it just has one blind spot on harassment or in particular sexual harassment. It's likely to be a blind spot there and across the board and many other issues. And I want to say that because it's important that ethics issues and integrity issues are not um, reduced to one issue as important and as unlawful as that issue may be, but that that issue is constantly understood in the broader realm um, of institutional integrity. Uh, and likewise, that gender issues and gender discrimination issues are not reduced solely to the issue of sexual harassment that there will be a range of gender inequalities uh, being played out and are being played out within the court of which sexual harassment uh, is one example, one very important example. Thanks very much, Bridget. And again, there would be so much more to dissect on this very important topic. And you rightly point to the multitude of actors, of course, the institutions themselves, um, and then uh, also the important role of individuals. My understanding is that um, within the organs of the court, reports are currently being prepared in response, so to speak, to the report to be published by the end of March. And I think then that conversation will be very interesting to follow as well with the ICC officials. Um, so certainly, our conversations around the recommendations will continue and it is expected that the multitude of recommendations are discussed, dissected, debating, debated, and in the short term and long term, um, we see developments in the months and years to come. Um, the institution building and of course introspection um, and any institutional reforms is of course a path that is sketched for the mid to, to long term. And, I'd like to, to bring in Ivana here at this point in the sense that often regarding integrity related topics, the, there's an appeal of sharing experiences and what can international courts and tribunals learn from other tribunal and accountability mechanisms in your view? What does the comparative element actually add value to such debates as we're seeing currently on the ICC? But of course, all the other courts are not immune to such introspection and to evaluation and public debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vivian, for, for the question. And uh, uh, I find all the discussion and topics so interesting, and I think we could spend the whole day probably discussing that. But I found uh, quite fascinating and ironical at the same time that the ICC Independent Expert Review reveals challenges that are ironically common to many international, probably most international tribunals. So I think that the review process should be welcome and the criticism and scrutiny to be considered as a key identifying areas for reform and ultimately improvement because justice and judicial institutions are not static and we should be open to identifying opportunities, improving quality and services. And uh, the, uh, the report uh, or the, the review identified many initiatives, which I believe are suitable for implementations and other tribunals as well, such as performance indicators, developments of higher judicial um, ethical standards. And I think it is something what uh, would be extremely important to have in common with other tribunals and opportunities for greater collaboration between, between tribunals. And I think it, it can apply to everything, uh, starting selection of judges, because it's not too important for this if judges are elected or appointed, but, but the criteria can, can be uh, and it should be very similar. And managing expectations, sharing experiences can, can help to improve uh, the process and also I believe strengthen it can strengthen 
the the process for accountability of all judicial institutions because if uh, there will be one common approach then then also the enforcement i think or, or compliance uh, would be much stronger thanks ivana and i think you rightly point out however uncomfortable at times an environment of increased scrutiny also provides a welcome opportunity to revisit certain dynamics um to revisit certain roles, certain, um, well, identification of topics. And, and one of the topics um, is, of course, the third topic we were going to turn to, that of independence, which is a cross-cutting Sorry, uh, Vivian, before you come there, can I just make one, one, one point? I think it's interesting and relates to the question that you put, that you put to, to Ivana. But, but the, the, uh, the, the, the Independent Expert Review Report does, does suggest that there should be an ethics committee that is set up, but that should be shared that, that, that should be shared with other international courts, uh, because there is a commonality. The, the ethics of, of one court shouldn't differ from those of another court. So I thought I would just to, to, just mention that in addition. Absolutely, very important point. Thanks for mentioning that, Richard. Excellent. Um, I think turning briefly to this topic of, of independence, and it will bring you right back in, is one that is also underscored by the independent expert review as being of paramount importance for integrity. And a core question pertains to how the integrity standard in international justice relates to this requirement of independence. As Hans Carell once, once highlighted, um, quote, international judges are operating under the eyes of the whole world and the impression they give and the way in which they perform their work will directly reflect on the standing of the institution that they serve. So Ivano, let me immediately get back to, to you, given your experience as an international judge um, and president of, of a tribunal. Your chapter in the book actually offers a very detailed reflection on the relationship between judicial independence and judicial accountability at international criminal courts and tribunals. And um, I would like to invite you to elaborate briefly on your perspective on this interrelationship between independence and integrity and how it is of, of direct value in your work and, and the work of other tribunals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think it's it's extremely important topic and uh, respecting judicial independence in all judicial systems, both national, of course, and international, is, is absolute key uh, to judicial um, making decisions. But I think we have to distinguish what independence is and what is not, because uh, uh, sometimes judicial independence is uh, misinterpreted in, in the way as justification for uh, avoiding accountability. So I think it's uh, it's absolutely necessary to respect and promote and strengthen judicial independence concerning making judicial decisions. But at the same time, I believe that it must be promoted accountability for all actions, for all behavior uh, judges, but also it applies to, to other other judicial, judicial officials. And I think um, the all international, most of international criminal tribunals share uh, some, some problems in common. And I think uh, uh, such um, uh, discussions and uh, review of the ICC are important to, to look for steps to, to improve. And I think regarding achievements, there were some, some steps and I think we are a relatively coherent uh, body of a case law across international courts and tribunals and arising from challenging, challenges, um, alleging impartiality of judges. And I think there's significant achievement in, in that and has been strengthened in recent years by adopting accountability mechanism, first at the ICC, subsequently uh, by the International Residual Mechanism, Kosovo Specialist Chambers and STL. Uh, I think uh, there's still room for improvement and um, I think we will discuss at the end, but uh, if there's one thing what uh, from my perspective I would love we can achieve in the future, to have one uh, judicial code of conduct and ethics for all tribunals and one system for accountability mechanism, because I think the accountability mechanism is, is absolutely necessary, but of course it must respect judicial independence and in the political setup of different tribunals, it might be difficult. So I believe if there's one common approach, it would uh, 
it would also it would also help and um, i think it's also related to efficiency in judicial proceedings because uh, sometimes uh, we may think that uh, that the request of strengthening for efficiency is also um, interference in judicial independence and i i believe there must be clear interpretation of judicial independence and uh, that uh, that efficiency does not mean interference in t- in, in judicial in- independence, and there must be balance between independence, accountability, and efficiency in order to promote integrity and also to promote legitimacy of international courts and judges. Mm. Thanks, Ivana. I'd like to invite um, Adele, who's also a judge, that on the perspective of judicial independence. Um, I know you also have. Your views and it would be great to, to hear your your views how it is in the national practice and how you see it at the international level yes of course um i had a glance at uh, the independent um, expert uh, review and as a matter of fact i was astonished a little bit about um the kind of misbehavior and uh, ethics violations and and other issues relating to behavior of um, certain official at the, the ICC, for example, and it, it stated that uh, there are a kind of current innocence of such uh, practices. Uh, I will deal with this later, um, but I, I want to focus on this issue of, of independence of the judiciary. In our national judicial system, we make a distinction between independence of the institution itself and the independence of the judge himself. So we have uh, a kind of individual independence, which which pertains to the judge, and an institutional independence. Uh, I didn't see this reflected in the report itself. So it is a kind of mixture. We have to focus when tackling the issues of independence on issue related to the independence of judges because the independence of the judge himself um, is a kind of accumulation. It's a kind of training. It's a kind of practice. It's a kind of, of, of morals as well to be independent, to not allow anyone to interfere in your judicial practice as, as, well, uh, as such. Uh, when it comes to an institutional independence, I can see there is a gap, a loophole in the international just, uh, justice system in general, because the selection of judges themselves, the, uh, the selection of judges, the nomination, the selection process is conducted by states, by politics, and in these cases, it is it is it is expected that the judge will be always loyal to his state. When it comes to our judicial national systems, this issue does not exist because judges are nominated and selected by judicial organs, not by states, by states, nomination, not by states, for example, firstly, and, and not by state parties in general. So I, I, I support Judge Goldstone issues that also I noticed in the report that they want to establish like a committee which is uh, consists of judges, current or uh, former judges, to have a kind of advisory opinion to the assembly of state parties and how to, n- to nominate judges and how to select judges. Thank you. Thank you, Adele. Now I'll turn it over to, to Richard in, in just a moment. Actually, we've started getting questions that have come in. Um, so I'll, I'll link one question um, and, and would ask um, Richard to come in here. One question that has been um, formulated is precisely picking up on a topic that Adele just mentioned um, about the role of the Assembly of States parties and the appointment process. And the question seeks to address a potential tension between high moral character. So in other words, is there a conflict of interest that you foresee for states if they base decisions on high moral character than national interests, which they should have at heart as the question 
goes. Maybe Richard, you can um, tackle that one as long as well as um, it would be wonderful if you could illuminate just very, very briefly. Um, you have a chapter in the anthology precisely about independence and integrity from a prosecutorial perspective. And you highlight the importance of the importance of care when it comes to prosecutorial language and the importance of prosecutors to diplomatically and astutely maneuver international politics without compromising their independence. Well, certainly it's a huge, it's a huge topic, but let me, let me deal with it as, uh, as, as, as briefly as I can. The, the, the fact that judges are, are, are nominated by states parties is, is, an, is really inevitable and really goes to the structure uh, that, that lies at the heart of, uh, of, the, Rome, uh, of the Rome statute. Uh, certainly it's expected, and I think that, that, that judges are, are very well aware of it, that once they are appointed, they really should shake off their, their, their uh, uh, domestic uh, identities and, and certainly the uh, domestic politics. Obviously, everybody brings their own character and their own sense of values uh, to, to the bench with them. That, 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 that's true of domestic as well as international judges. But what's crucially important is, is really the two aspects of independence, it seems to me, that, 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 that we should have regard to. The, the one which has been uh, already referred to by, by, by uh, uh, Adet is, is the independence, the, indep the external independence. Judges should be absolutely and completely independent of any outside influence, whether it's governmental or civil society or whatever. Uh, for judges to do their jobs properly, they, 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 they cannot uh, in any way, uh, 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 openly or secretly, they cannot in any way be influenced by, 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 by what they are told to do uh, by, by any masters or any influences that, that there might be. The internal independence is also important, and the internal independence of judges requires them to, to decide cases solely on the evidence and the law uh, that that applies to the cases uh, the, that applies to the cases before them. What I think that doesn't have enough attention is the independence of the prosecutor and members of the office of the prosecutor. That's more nuanced and more difficult. Prosecutors, prosecutors are on the side of the victims. Prosecutors, prosecutors investigate and, and, and take witness statements and obviously are influenced uh, by, by what they are told. So I think it's more difficult. I think prosecutors have to have, uh, have, to have a strong uh, moral and ethical standard and fiber uh, to, 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 to ensure uh, that, uh, that they're not influenced in a way that isn't justified by the information uh, and, uh, and the evidence that uh, that comes that comes before them. So I think I think there's a lot of work. I think I think I think the book uh, that but the uh, the book we are launching has a huge amount of material on this. And let me say in passing that what impresses me very much is, is the very full attention that's given to the IER report, uh, both both in the author's uh, preface. And more importantly, in the in the opening chapter uh, that you, Vivian and Morton, have authored. Thanks very much, Richard. And I think I'd like to continue inviting um, participants to submit questions to the panelists. We'll be taking them and weaving them into the discussion as we as we just have already did. I think, um, as you just pointed out, Richard, this brings us to the fourth topic that we're exploring here today, which is cultivating integrity and bolstering a culture of integrity. Put simply, a key challenge often observed is getting from talking the talk to walking the walk. So strengthening this culture of integrity within the institutions to prevent integrity violations in the first place, and then to address them effectively is of course very important. Such introspection is, is not easy, of course, um, but it seems that there is a direct interest to ensure that the institutions are more robust, that they're enduring and can withstand ever-growing scrutiny. So um, I would be curious, um, of course, we can't delve into the whole aspect and there will be so much to be said about what causes integrity violations in the first place and indications in, in research, of course, point to a combination of legal, social, political 
organizational and individual factors, as, as many of you today have already highlighted. Um, but certainly, as has been said from the get-go, leadership is, is immensely important. Leaders set the tone in the organization. And um, here I'd like to, to come to this particular aspect of cultivating integrity. And this relates to one of the questions that we've been receiving, um, which is how effective are the mechanisms within international tribunals to see and uphold integrity, um, which of course means upholding this high moral character in day in, day out in the official functions in the tribunals. Um, so Ivana, let me, let me turn to you. Why is it so important in your view and experience that from the leadership down, the focus on integrity percolates and what can be done to nurture such a culture of integrity? What is needed? Um, what works well? Where do we have to go? Thank you. Uh, I, I think it's extremely important in all systems and uh, that uh, the judges, leaders of the tribunals are accountable. And um, in, national, on, in most national systems, uh, there is a set up judicial disciplinary proceedings. In the international tribunals, it's, it's quite a new topic, in fact, and uh, the accountability mechanism I mentioned, they are quite new. And for many years, there were no uh, accountability recognized, I think, internally in, in tribunals. Uh, but, uh, but I think there are two roles of this mechanism. First is preventive, uh, simply to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to prevent, because there must be rules for, for judges and leaders of the court uh, to, have to, to be held accountable. But I think it's also important towards the public, what can be expected from judges to see that, uh, that, all, uh, is, uh, that nobody is above uh, law, above, above uh, any rules. Uh, what, what works, I think it's, it's a little bit complicated because the problem is how we set up this accountability mechanism. And uh, I think in my view is that the ideal situation would be there will be one uh, accountability mechanism for all international tribunals. And um, because this mechanism should be also independent and must protect judges from misusing, but also to protect their independence. So I think it's preventive and then so practical, but uh, it's it's still a, big, still a beginning. And what Richard mentioned, the establishment of ethical committee uh, across the tribunals, I think this is just an absolute excellent idea. And I think that will be probably first step towards later, that would be my hope to uh, common code of conduct and come out, uh, common uh, system of accountability. Thank you very much, Ivana. Let me bring in Bridget here. I know her chapter focuses precisely on conformity, leadership, and culture of integrity um, to, to share some of her perspectives on the importance of nurturing a culture of integrity. And then we'll take a couple of questions after that. Well, I think, I, sorry, was that addressed to me, Vivian? Sure, why don't you go and then Bridget will, will join yes, us. Sorry, sorry. No, carry on. No, no, please, you, 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 you carry on. Please, Richard. Well, I, I, I agree with everything that 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 Ivana has suggested. I think the 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 important aspect, I think, too, that must be taken into account, is that really the independence of of, of judges are, are, are to be seen in their judgments. Uh, that, after all, is very important. They're accountable to the to the public, and international court is is accountable to the international public. And that's where civil society comes in uh, and, 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 and the academic community come in. Uh, the judges, I think, are very conscious of, 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 of criticism and critique of, of the work they do. And I think that, that really is, 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 is fundamental, uh, both, both to the ethics of, of, of the judges of any, particular, of any particular court, again, it applies as much to domestic courts as to international courts. And, and, and it's that sensitivity uh, to, 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 to what they say, that, that, that is very important. And, and, and there are no, there are no secret, se secret judgments given or, uh, for, for ulterior purposes. They, they, they hang out and are, there to, and are there for all to be seen. 
Thanks, Richard. You you also mentioned bringing in civil society, so let's just do that and and have Bridget chime in. Thank you, Viviana. Can I just check with you? Um, will we also be discussing some of our recommend the recommendations we wish to highlight in the IAR, or should I weave that into my response to this question? Sure. Why don't you do that now? Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, um, I want to start by just saying that. Um, Often what we think needs to happen uh, can, can result in what we could call horizon conflicts, meaning there will be some people who are looking immediately over the edge of what needs to be done. There are others who might be looking out to sea um, some way off the coast, and there are others who are looking at the horizon. So what we're looking at and what we're paying attention to influences the actions we think are necessary and important. So from my perspective, one of the really strong um, recommendations in the IAR report relates to the establishment of an ethics and business conduct office. In fact, it's not quite a recommendation. It's, a, it's uh, asking the states or the court to consider the convenience of establishing um, an ethics and business conflict office. I would have been much less polite um, than, than the wisdom of, of Richard and his committee members. Um, I think that that sort of office is critical, it's urgent, it needs to be prioritized in this financial year for the establishment of next year, which means preparatory work is done this year. This is an office that needs to be responsible for training around ethics, for compliance, for being a sounding board for staff members to think through and talk through genuine ethical challenges uh, which arise in the course of their work. Um, to be alert to and responsive to breaches of ethics and to really be in, uh, investing retrospectively in the institution building work that was skipped over by the court uh, and was supported in the skipping over of those steps by states parties. Um, so anything th that is a, a real urgent priority from my perspective. Also the proper resourcing of all the components of the internal quite um, limited internal oversight structure. So greater funding and resourcing for the Office of Internal Audit uh, and, for the, um, and for the independent oversight mechanism. In addition to that, what else I think is needed uh, with respect to safeguarding institutional justice institutions relates to the governance of those institutions. And this is where I think states parties have a significant responsibility for the current status of the court. In many respects, they have the court they have settled for. They have the court that reflects the decisions they have made through CBF, the Committee on Budget and Finance, through the ASPs, through the Audit Committee over many years. Um, and what we are needing, in my view, are new models of diplomacy and multilateral leadership to emerge. The willingness of states' parties to be honest with themselves and each other, to express loyalty to the institutions that they are overseeing, um, and to support the mandate of those institutions without the institutional compromises we've seen is really critical for the ICC to be able to turn around its current situation. I want to just uh, end this little piece by saying everyone has an opportunity to reset. The court has an opportunity to reset. We don't have the opportunity to rewrite. So the court needs to stop trying to rewrite its history and experiences, to rewrite what's happened in the last few years or 10 years ago. Its history is there. It cannot be rewritten. And it stands, it stands as critiqued by the IER, as well as the book uh, we're launching today, the chapters in the book we're launching today. But everyone has an opportunity to reset themselves. We have that opportunity as individuals and institutions have that opportunity. And with the IER and this book, and the critique it provides about the ethical and institutional issues before the ICC, this is an urgent and ideal moment for the ICC to reset itself and to start becoming the court it wishes to be rather than the court it has it, of its past, the court that is summarized so devastatingly in the IER uh, and in the critiques of the book. It's not a court without um, merit, without progress, without many good things happening, without a largely rule compliant staff, without highly motivated civil servants in the international justice sector. But it is a court that has become tired, jaded and fatigued and it needs both renewal and to take this moment to reset itself on an ethical trajectory so it is sustainable and has long-term legitimacy as a trusted purveyor of global justice in an increasingly polarized world. Before we come to the end of our discussion, I know Adele wanted to, to chime in on this importance 
um, important topic of culture of integrity. And I'd like to, to put a question that we've received also from, from an audience member to, to him, which is precisely about the relationship of the international and the national. And the question is, which lessons might be learned from the discourse on integrity for the delivery, delivery of international justice through domestic courts, such as those, for example, where it's based on universal jurisdictions or where international crimes are prosecuted in domestic courts. Um, Adele, over to you, um, if you could perhaps combine these two elements of the national perspective on culture of integrity and at the same time, this interplay of the international and national and how one might inform the national sphere. I will do it with pleasure. Um, firstly, let me raise two observations about the independent expert review. I think if states parties are willing to reform the international criminal justice system, they should implement the recommendations issued in this report. But I know as, at the same time that implementing those recommendations is a little bit difficult because in the report, if, if, if you have uh, a glance at the report, the report um, uh, has have many recommend has, has issued many recommendations concerning the, the, the establishment of councils and committees, and there are many committees and councils. In this case, let us look at what is going on on the judicial level. On the judicial level, you need to have uh, special councils or courts to try those who act uh, in an ethical manner, for example. Uh, you should have um, as well councils who judge which judges should go or to be disqualified or not. So disqualification and disciplinary measure and the removal of office, just look at the national practice. For example, in Egypt, in Egypt, we have two layers, which is an, a, a first layer, which is by, 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 by appeal courts, where judges who are accused of committing some acts that disqualify them, they go first to this first instant court, then they can appeal the judgment, the decision before the Court of Cassation itself. We have issued many decisions on these disciplinary measures. And I think this, this occurs in, in, in every national jurisdiction. So why don't we look at the national jurisdiction when it comes to disqualification, removal of office from office to see how national jurisdiction behave and address these issues, for example. Thank you very much, Adele. Um, on that note, we are coming to the end of this fascinating exchange, I'm afraid, um, just looking at the time. And I'd like now to invite our experts to share some final reflections, perhaps take one minute each. Um, and let's start with you, Richard. Well, th thanks, Vivian. I, I would add, to, to just, to, just by making one point, at, 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 well, two points, really. The first is that we only have one international criminal court. Its work is crucial. And we have to make it as good as it can be. That, that, that should be the aim of all people uh, who, who regard international justice as important, and particularly all people who have regard uh, for, uh, for the victims and how important justice is, uh, justice is for them. The second point is that, 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 and I'm really repeating what I think, think I said earlier, it all depends on strong leadership and moral commitment. Excellent. Thank you very much, Richard, for this very concise but powerful um, appeal. Thank you. Um, I now turn to Bridget. Thank you. Well, um, I want to say briefly that we know inequalities are sustained by being institutionalized, and we can see that in the staff profile of the court with respect to the inequalities around geographical representation uh, and the limited number of women in mid-level management and senior management and leadership positions. And so I very much support the recommendations in the IER around addressing some of that systemic uh, discrimination and perhaps bias around the appointments uh, to, of a greater diversity of, um, of leadership, um, both geographical and, and gender. 
Um, and also, lastly, just to say that um, whilst we all feel that more needs to be done and there are insufficient mechanisms, there are some mechanisms. Uh, and I think the court needs to use ex exercise greater use of its existing mechanisms and framework. For example, we've heard repeatedly over many years when uh, there's a scandal or a crisis that states will often say, or sometimes the court will say, we just don't have the mechanism to deal with that. Um, and I'm thinking most recently of the um, issues which I critique in my chapter of institutional corruption with respect to the restructuring and revision project. Uh, and I go into that in, in serious detail. It's not a flippant um, uh, soundbite to, to make that statement. Um, but there we had, in fact, a number of existing mechanisms that could have intervened to have uh, averted this crisis and corruption that could have alerted states and court officials to it at an earlier stage um, and could also have provided discipline, appropriate disciplinary measures to those responsible for it. Um, there was the financial rules and regulations, there are the disciplinary measures outlined in the Rome Statute and the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, uh, there was the role of the president with respect to the registrar and the presidency with respect to the ensuring the proper administration of justice. I think there are more mechanisms and processes that exist for the courts and states parties to use if they are so motivated to use them. Thank you. Over to you, Adele, for a one minute concluding remark. Yeah. Um, I just want to stress that the standards that international judges should uphold must be set even higher than at the national level, that they should be selected after credible inquiry. Just to mention something about the national practice, in Egypt, for example, judges are not selected only in basis of their CV. Uh, the national authorities will do, will do inquiries, investigation about their demeanor, their behavior, their history, and even and even sometimes the history of their relatives, they might affect their selection. If there are some kind of criminal records about those who are surrounding them, this might affect uh, their selection. So my point is that please focus in the inquiry procedures that is required to select judges from the beginning. Thank you, Adele. And finally, we look forward to final reflections from Ivana. Thank you. Thank you very much. I agree with my colleagues. I would like to emphasize that important, super important is selection of judges, but also all principals, prosecutors, registrar, and um, also uh, the, the high moral character, professional uh, qualities, but also, also suitability to work at the international tribunal because it is very different from national level. So uh, kind of openness and uh, uh, stay humble and grounded uh, for working with others. I think it's extremely important. And uh, then uh, to have one uh, common uh, code of ethics for all international judges and uh, one system of uh, potential accountability mechanism. And not to forget what Richard said, we are, international courts and tribunals are here for, for to spread the justice, justice for victims, not ideally for internal disputes, but we have to manage and, and limit the internal disputes. And thank you very much again for this opportunity, because I think in third thing I can mention this open discussion and public discussion about this topic is probably the very first step. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Well, that concludes our event today. Thank you very much once again wholeheartedly to our distinguished panelists for being with us. Once again, special thanks to all the authors of the book and to all experts who contribute to a fuller appreciation of integrity in international justice. As we have been reminded today, integrity is indispensable for international justice. Nurturing integrity within international justice institutions requires careful and critical contemplation on the functioning of institutions, values, rules, and purposes, and a wider commitment to the international legal order. Thank you to everyone who has been with us and has been watching. It has been a great conversation. Thank you very much. Stay well, stay safe, and stay in Tiga. Goodbye. <laughs>